Hello, and welcome to Something for Kids, Storytelling for the Young and the Young at Heart. My name is Father Steve Demuth. I'm Rector of Holy Trinity Episcopal Church in Covina, and glad you're with us tonight. Uh, we are in the midst of reading Prince Caspian, the second book in the series The Chronicles of Narnia. We read the first book of The Chronicles of Narnia earlier this year, and if you would like to catch up on that book, please go to our historic Holy Trinity Church of Covina uh, YouTube channel, and um, you can follow us there. You can click on the subscribe button and, and find us uh, anytime that something new is going on. Uh, you can click on the announcements button, and you can also leave a message. If you are live streaming, let us know that you're here and uh, if you're enjoying the program. Um, it's been an eventful couple days for many reasons, uh, but here in California, we're having our very cold winter. Um, we can see the snow on the mountaintops uh, in the distance, uh, but still the sun is shining and uh, the grass is green as the song goes. Uh, what is it like where you are? I know that some of my friends on the East Coast are having a more um, full winter and uh, it's going to get even colder in the months to come. So I am glad we are here by a lit fireplace with three lovely warm dogs and um, a family and friends and uh, it's good to be here. So we are in chapter 10 already of Prince Caspian, and we left off on what Lucy saw. And I asked a couple questions at the end of the last episode. Lucy believed she saw Aslan, the lion, the king from across the sea, the emperor from across the sea, and um, she was trying to tell the others that he was beckoning them or, or trying to lead them to go up to where they needed to go instead of down and around. But they wouldn't believe her. And Edmund, to uh, our surprise, suggested that they listen to her because in the first book, their first adventure in Narnia, they didn't believe her at all, but she ended up to be telling the truth. Unfortunately, Susan and Peter are older and quote unquote wiser, and they know better. They may have lost a little bit of their trust or faith in Aslan. I hope they haven't, but we'll soon see, because this chapter, chapter 10, is called The Return of the Lion. Let's begin. To keep along the edge of the gorge was not so easy as it had looked. Before they had gone many yards, they were confronted with young fir woods growing up on the very edge. And after they had tried to go through these stooping and pushing for about 10 minutes, they realized that in there, it would take them an hour to go half a mile. So they came back and out again and decided to go around the fir wood. This took them much farther to their right than they wanted to go, far out of sight of the cliffs and out of sound of the river, till they began to be afraid that they had lost it altogether. Nobody knew the time, but it was getting to the hottest part of the day. When they were able at last to go back to the edge of the gorge, nearly a mile below the point from which they had started, they found the cliffs on their side of it a good deal lower and more broken. Soon they found a way down into the gorge and continued the journey at the river's edge. But first they had to rest and had a long drink. No one was talking anymore about breakfast or even dinner with Caspian. They may have been wise to stick to the rush instead of going along the top, 
it kept them sure of their direction, and ever since the fir wood, the all had been afraid of being forced too far out of their course and losing themselves in the wood. It was an old and pathless forest, and you could not keep anything like a straight course in it. Patches of hopeless brambles, fallen trees, boggy places, and dense undergrowth would be always getting in your way. But the gorge of the rush was not at all a nice place for traveling either. I mean, it was not a nice place for people in a hurry. For an afternoon's ramble, ending in a picnic tea, it would have been delightful. It had everything you could want on an occasion of that sort, rumbling waterfalls, silver cascades, deep amber-colored pools, mossy rocks, and deep moss on the banks in which you could sink over your ankles every kind of fern, jewel-like dragonflies, sometimes a hawk overhead, and once, Peter and Trumpkin both thought, an eagle. But of course, what the children and the dwarf wanted to see as soon as possible was the great river below them, and Baruna, and the way to Aslan's Howe. As they went on, the rush began to fall more and more steeply. Their journey became more and more of a climb and less and less of a walk. In places, even a dangerous climb over slippery rock with a nasty drop into dark chasms and the river roaring angrily at the bottom. You may be sure they watched the cliffs on their left eagerly for any sign of a break or any place where they could climb them. But those cliffs remained cruel. It was maddening because everyone knew that it once they were out of the gorge on that side, they would have only a smooth slope and a fairly short walk to Caspian's headquarters. The boys and the dwarf were now in favor of lighting a fire and cooking some bear meat. Susan didn't want this. She only wanted, as she said, to get on and finish it and get out of these beastly woods. Lucy was far too tired and miserable to have any opinion about anything. But as there was no dry wood to be had, it mattered very little what anyone thought. The boys began to wonder if raw meat was really as nasty as they had always been told. Trumpkin assured them it was. Of course, if the children had attempted a journey like this a few days ago in England, they would have been knocked up. I think I have explained before how Narnia was altering them. Even Lucy was by now, so to speak, only one third of a little girl going to boarding school for the first time, and two thirds of Queen Lucy of Narnia. At last, said Susan. Oh, hooray, said Peter. The river gorge had just made a bend, and the whole view spread out beneath them. They could see open country stretching before them to the horizon, and between it and them, the broad silver ribbon of the great river. They could see the specially broad and shallow place, which had been once the fords of Verona, but was now spanning by a long, many-arched bridge. There was a little town at the far end of it. By Jove, said Edmund, we fought the Battle of Verona, just where that town is. This cheered the boys more than anything. You can't help feeling stronger when you look at a place where you once won a glorious victory, not to mention a kingdom, hundreds of years ago. Peter and Edmund were soon so busy talking about the battle that they forgot their sore feet and the heavy drag of their male shirts on their shoulders. The dwarf was interested too. They were all getting on at a quicker pace now. The going became easier. Though there were still sheer cliffs on their left, 
The ground was becoming lower on their right. Soon it was no longer a gorge at all, only a valley. There were no more waterfalls, and presently they were in fairly thick woods again. Then, all at once, whiz! And a sound rather like the stroke of a woodpecker. The children were still wondering where, ages ago, they had heard a sound just like that, and why they disliked it so, when Trumpkin shouted, Down! At the same moment, forcing Lucy, who happened to be next to him, flat down into the bracken. Peter, who had been looking up to see if he could see a spot uh, or a squirrel, had it seen what it was, a long, cruel arrow sunk into a tree trunk just above his head. As he pulled Susan down and dropped himself, another came rasping over his shoulder and struck the ground at his side. Quick, quick! Get back! Crawl! panted Trumpkin. They turned and wiggled along uphill under the bracken amid clouds of horribly buzzing flies. Under the bracken, arrows whizzed round them. One struck Susan's helmet with a sharp ping and glanced off. They crawled quicker. Sweat poured off them. Then they ran, stooping nearly double. The boys held their swords in their hands for fear they would trip on them. It was heartbreaking work, all uphill again, back over the ground they had already traveled. When they felt like they really couldn't run anymore, even to save their lives, they all dropped down into the damp moss beside a waterfall and behind a big boulder, panting. They were surprised to see how high they had already got. They listened intently and no sound of pursuit. So that's all right, said Trumpkin, drawing a deep breath. They're not searching the wood, only sentries, I expect. But it means that Miraz has an outpost down there. Bottles and battle droves, it was a near thing. I ought to have had my head smacked for bringing us this way at all, said Peter. On the contrary, your majesty, said the dwarf. For one thing, it wasn't you. It was your royal brother, King Edmund, who first suggested going by Glasswater. I'm afraid the DLF is right, said Edmund, who had quite honestly forgotten this ever, since things began going wrong. And for another, continued Trumpkin, if we'd gone my way, We'd have walked straight into the new outpost, most likely, or at least had just the same trouble avoiding it. I think this glass water route has turned out for the best. A blessing in disguise, said Susan. Some disguise, said Edmund. I suppose we'll have to go right up the gorge again now, said Lucy. Lou, you're a hero, said Peter. That's the nearest you've got today to saying, I told you so. Let's go on. And as soon as we're well up into the forest, said Drumkin, whatever anyone says, I'm going to light a fire and cook supper. But we must get well away from here. There is no need to describe how they toiled back up the gorge. It was pretty hard work, but oddly enough, everyone felt more cheerful. They were getting their second wind and the word supper had had a wonderful effect. They reached the fir wood, which had caused them so much trouble while it was still daylight, and bivouacked in the hollow just above it. It was tedious gathering the firewood, but it was grand when they got the fire blazing up, and they began producing the damp and smeary parcels of bear meat, which would have been so very unattractive to anyone who had spent the day indoors. The dwarf had splendid ideas about cookery. Each apple, they still had a few of these, was wrapped up in bear's meat, as if it was to be apple dumpling with meat instead of pastry, only much thicker, and spiked on a sharp stick and then roasted. And the juice of the apple worked all through the meat, like applesauce with roast pork. Bear that has lived too much 
on other animals is not very nice, but bear that has had plenty of honey and fruit is excellent, and this turned out to be that sort of bear. It was a truly glorious meal. And, of course, no washing up, only lying back and watching the smoke from Trumpkin's pipe and stretching one's tired legs and chatting. Everyone felt quite hopeful now about finding King Gaspian tomorrow and defeating Miraz in a few days. It may not have been sensible to them to feel like this, but they did. They dropped off to sleep one by one, but all pretty quickly. Lucy woke out of the deepest sleep as you can imagine, with the feeling that the voice she liked best in the world had been calling her name. She thought at first it was her father's voice, but that didn't seem quite right. Then she thought it was Peter's voice, but that did not seem so fit either. She did not want to get up, not because she was still tired. On the contrary, she was wonderfully rested and all the aches had gone out of her bones, but because she felt so extremely happy and comfortable. She was looking straight up at the Narnian moon, which is larger than ours, and at the starry sky, for the place where they had bivouacked was completely open. Lucy! came the call again. Neither her father's voice nor Peter's. She sat up, trembling with excitement, but not with fear. The moon was so bright that the whole forest landscape around her was almost as clear as day, though it looked wilder. Behind her was the fir wood. Away to her right, the jagged cliff tops on the far side of the gorge. Straight ahead, open grass to where a glade of trees began about a bowshot away. Lucy looked very hard at the trees of that glade. Why? I do believe they're moving, she said to herself. They're walking about. She got up, her heart beating wildly, and walked towards them. There was certainly a noise in the glade, a noise such as trees make in a high wind, though there were no wind tonight. Yet it was not exactly an ordinary tree noise either. Lucy felt that there was a tune in it, but she could not match the tune any more than that she had been able to catch the words when the trees had so nearly talked to her the night before but there was at least a lilt. She felt her own feet wanting to dance as she got nearer. And now that there was no doubt that the trees were really moving, moving in and out through one another as if in a complicated country dance. And I suppose, thought Lucy, when trees dance, it must be a very, very country dance indeed. She was almost among them now, the first tree she looked at seemed at first glance not to be a tree at all, but a huge man with a shaggy beard and great bushes of hair. She was not frightened. She had seen such things before. But when she looked again, he was only a tree, though he was still moving. You couldn't see whether he had feet or roots, of course, because when trees move, they don't walk on the surface of the earth. They wade in it as we do water. The same thing happened with every tree she looked at. At one moment, they seemed to be friendly, lovely giant and giantess forms, which the tree people put on when some good magic has called them into full life. Next moment, they looked all trees again. But when they looked like trees, it was like strangely human trees. And when they looked like people, it was like strangely branchy and leafy people. And all the time that queer, lilting, rustling, cool, merry noise. They are almost awake. Not quite, said Lucy. She knew 
She herself was wide awake, wider than anyone usually is. She went fearlessly in among them, dancing herself as she leaped this way and that to avoid being run into by these huge partners. But she was only half interested in them. She wanted to get beyond them to something else. It was from beyond them that the dear voice had called. She soon got through them, half wondering whether she had been using her arms to push branches aside or to take hands in a giant chain with big dancers who stooped to reach her. For they were really a ring of trees round a central open place. She stepped out from among their shifting confusion of lovely light and shadows. A circle of grass, smooth as a lawn, met her eyes with dark trees dancing all around it. And then, oh joy, for he was there, the huge lion shining white in the moonlight with his huge black shadow beneath him. But for the movement of his tail, he might have been a stone lion. But Lucy never thought of that. She never stopped to think whether he was a friendly lion or not. She rushed to him. She felt her heart would burst if she lost a moment. And the next thing she knew, she was kissing him and putting her arms as far around his neck as she could and burying her face in the beautiful, rich silkiness of his mane. Aslan, 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 dear Aslan, sobbed Lucy. At last, the great beast rolled over on his side so that Lucy fell, half sitting and half lying between his front paws. He bent forward and just touched her nose with his tongue. The warm breath came all round her. She gazed up into the large, wise face. Welcome, child, he said. Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. That is because you are older, little one, answered he. Not because you are? I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. For a time she was so happy that she did not want to speak. But Aslan spoke. Lucy, he said, we must not lie here for long. You have work in hand, and much time has been lost today. Yes, wasn't it a shame, said Lucy. I saw you all right. They wouldn't believe me. They're all so... From somewhere deep inside Aslan's body, there came the faintest suggestion of a growl. I'm sorry, said Lucy, who understood some of his moods. I didn't mean to start slanging the others, but it wasn't my fault anyway, was it? The lion looked straight into her eyes. Oh, Aslan, said Lucy. You don't mean it was. How could I? I I couldn't have left the others and come up to you alone. How could I? Don't look at me like that. Oh, well, I suppose I could. Yes, and it would have been alone, I know. Not if I was with you, but what would have been the good of that? Aslan said nothing. You mean, said Lucy rather faintly, that it would have turned out all right somehow? But how, please, Aslan, am I not to know? To know what would have happened, child, said Aslan, no. Nobody is ever told that. Oh, dear, said Lucy. But anyone can find out what will happen, said Aslan, if you go back to the others now and wake them up and tell them you have seen me again and that you must all get up at once and follow me. What will happen? There is only one way of finding out. 
Do you mean that it is what you want me to do? gasped Lucy. Yes, little one, said Aslan. Will the others see you too? asked Lucy. Certainly not at first, said Aslan. Later on, it depends. But won't they believe me? said Lucy. It doesn't matter, said Aslan. Oh dear, oh dear, said Lucy. And I was so pleased at finding you again. And I thought that you'd let me stay. And I thought you'd come roaring in and frighten all the enemies away like, like last time. And now everything is going to be horrid. It is hard for you, little one, said Aslan. But things never happen the same way twice. It has been hard for us all in Narnia before now. Lucy buried her head in his mane to hide from his face. But there must have been some magic in his mane. She could feel lion strength going into her. Quite suddenly, she sat up. I'm sorry, Aslan, she said. I'm ready now. Now you are a lioness, said Aslan, and now all Narnia will be renewed. But come, we have no time to lose. He got up and walked with stately, noiseless paces back to the belt of dancing trees through which she had just come, and Lucy went with him, laying a rather tremulous hand on his mane. The trees parted to let them through, and for one second assumed their human forms completely. Lucy had a glimpse of tall and lovely wood gods and wood goddesses all bowing to the lion. Next moment they were trees again, but still bowing, with such graceful sweeps of branch and trunk that their bowing was itself a kind of dance. Now, child, said Aslan, when they had left the trees behind them, I will wait here. Go and wake the others and tell them to follow. If they will not, then you at least must follow me alone. It is a terrible thing to have to wake four people, all older than yourself and all very tired, for the purpose of telling them something they probably won't believe and making them do something they certainly won't like. I mustn't think about it. I must just do it, thought Lucy. She went to Peter first and shook him. Peter, she whispered in his ear, wake up, quick, Aslan is here. He says, we've got to follow him at once. Certainly, Lou, whatever you like, said Peter unexpectedly. This was encouraging. But as Peter instantly rolled around and went to sleep again, it wasn't much use. Then she tried Susan. Susan really did wake up, but only to say in her most annoying grown-up voice, You've been dreaming, Lucy. Go to sleep again. She tackled Edmund next. It was very difficult to wake him, but when at last she had done it, he was really awake and sat up. Eh? Huh? He said in a grumpy voice. What are you talking about? She said it all over again. This was one of the worst parts of her job, for each time she said it, it sounded less convincing. Aslan, said Edmund, jumping up. Hooray! Where? Lucy turned back to where she could see the lion waiting, his patient eyes fixed upon her. There, she said, pointing. Where? asked Edmund again. There, there. Don't you see? Just this side of the trees. Edmund stared hard for a while and then said, no, there's nothing there. You've got dazed and, and muddled in the moonlight. One does, you know. I thought I saw something for a moment myself. It's only an optical, what do you call it? I can see him all the same, said Lucy. He's looking straight at us. Then why can't I see him? He said, you might not be able to. Why? I don't know. That's what he said. Oh, bother it all, said Edmund. 
I do wish you wouldn't keep on seeing things, but I suppose we'll have to wake the others. And here ends chapter 10, The Return of the Lion. I wonder how scary and frustrating and daunting a task it was for little Lucy to try to wake up the others and convince them of something she believed but they couldn't see. I think, in a way, that's what our faith is like. We can't see God, but God sees us, and God speaks to us, and we catch glimpses of God in beauty and in love, especially in love, and in nature, and sometimes in music, and in animal kind, but it's hard to see God. Jesus teaches us that what we do in love for others is like we do it for him, and that all creation is made somehow in God's image, but still, wouldn't it be lovely to see God for yourself? Someday, someday we will. I think it's time for our song. I sing the song of the saints of God, and I hope you have the sheet with you, or you've printed it out, or you can look it up on the computer, or somehow, or maybe you have it in your virtual Bible school booklet. I sing a song of the saints of God. Let's sing all three verses. I sing a song of the saints of God, patient and brave and true, who toiled and fought and lived and died for the Lord they loved and knew. And one was a doctor, and one was a queen, and one was a shepherdess on the green. They were all of them saints of God, and I mean God helping to be one too. Big breath. They loved their Lord so dear, so dear, and God's love made them strong. They followed the right for Jesus' sake, the whole of their good lives long. And one was a soldier, and one was a priest, and one was slain by a fierce wild beast. And there's not any reason, no, not the least, why I shouldn't be one too. They lived not only in ages past, there are hundreds of thousands still. The world is bright with the joyous saints who love to do Jesus' will. You can meet them in school, or in lanes, or at sea, in church, or in trains, or in shops, or at tea. For the saints of God are just folk like me, and I mean to be one too. I hope you like our song, I Sure Do, and I hope to be a saint someday too, don't you? I think that would be good. Probably not a very saintly saint, but maybe a saint not with a, a little s, not a big, big s, but a little s. Um, and I think we're all called to try to be saints with God's help, or at least to love lots and lots and lots and lots. So we are coming to the end of our time, and I thought we could say a prayer today together. Uh, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord God, today I am thinking of all those with aches and pains and in need of healing. 
We pray for Paco, whose knees sometimes hurt very badly, who had surgery and still there's some pain. And we pray for relief. We pray for our little doggies who sometimes have terrible coughs. One of the coughs sounds like a like a, a, a turkey gobbling, a choo! And it's kind of funny, but kind of sad at the same time. I think of people at the Masonic homes near us, a place where seniors live and enjoy their life, um, but now are on lockdown because of the coronavirus. And some of them are sick and um, they feel sometimes isolated. And so we pray for them. We pray for our friend Gloria and her daughter and all she loves and her whole family, that God would heal them and help them to be able to breathe more freely and feel better. We pray for those who are frightened and we pray for those who need work. We pray for those who have to go to work and um, are anxious. And we pray for the upcoming school term. And we pray for our teachers. Of course, we pray for mom and dad and our guardians and our sisters and brothers and aunts and uncles and cousins. We pray for our neighbors on either side and across the street and for their families as well. And we pray for all of God's creatures whether they can speak like humans or they communicate in other ways that are special to them. We pray that you would teach us to respect God's creation, your own creation, O oh Lord, and that we would try to learn from them and keep them safe. So Lord, as we go to sleep this evening, help us to sleep in your loving arms. Help us to have a good night's sleep and to feel better and rested in the morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, that's all for tonight. Episode 10, can you believe it? There's only five more chapters to go, and we have read the entire book of Prince Caspian. We're zooming through this book, and I hope you're enjoying the adventure. So until the next time, goodbye and God bless.